hangout or not. And we are now beginning and we will launch the light bulb. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack. One of these days we're going to have like sound effects to go with that. Portentia, I'm still behind the curve on that because of the difficulties of, of generating these things. Uh, this is um, Peter's wonderful logo here. There's TortukanWordPress.com, my troubles in paradise project, and uh, the methodology of creationism. If you don't have that website up, please get it up uh, and have it and access it and you get it on your smartphone, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, we've got a couple guests today, uh, uh, Cap and Jackson, who will be uh, listening to me pontificate and then hopefully offering sage commentary and response so that we can have things. Oh, we got a couple of old scratch there. Hi, gang in the live chat uh and uh, so one of you or both of you can also keep an eye on on the live chat um uh, i'll try to glance over there every once in a while but if people come up with questions and and side issues are like he's droning on um let me know anyway uh, the main topic is the uh continuation of the discussion of um uh the um uh, stupid creationist book and is that not redundant um <laughs> the uh, uh, contested bones whoops uh, Contested Bones by uh, Christopher uh, Ruby and John Sandford. Uh, and what I'm doing is uh, applied source methods. I, in fact, you can see all of my horrifyingly detailed uh, sketch notes and circling of footnotes and all that kind of stuff. So I'm defacing my book, uh, the book here, my copy of the book. But uh, the neat thing is, is what I'm doing is, is uh, uh, generating a bibliography and looking at how they're using sources. And uh, uh, previous episodes uh, uh, had demonstrated that they were really bad scholars, and so far they haven't changed any. Uh, one little blip, however, that I will uh, insert because I alluded to it uh, before we get off on to Rupi and Sanford um, was the Ark Encounter Kinds. Uh, yesterday, my brain woke me up and said, "I've got a picture, a blurry one, but a picture that's at the museum that um, they posted on their website that lists the kinds on the Ark." And my brain said, wow, that's actually really unusual to list the kinds on the Ark. Uh, so you can actually get a thing of them. Uh, well, now, I couldn't see the names because the picture was too blurry. And if anybody has a high resolution picture of that anywhere that you can actually read what the listings are, let me know, forward it to me uh, by email or whatever, because I'd love to have it. But I could at least tell how many spaces there were, how many names were on the list, even though I couldn't tell what what they were. So I, I generated a spreadsheet and you could tell uh, like how many synapsid kinds, all extinct, they're two per animal. Uh, and then the other ones, all the uh, 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 flappy animals, uh, birds and bats have uh, 14 members. They're apparently clean. And so uh, you could calculate how many kinds there were, how many extinct kinds there were, how many animals were on board the ark. Uh, and you could just work it out as a spreadsheet according to their numbers. And the one thing that really pops up out of the 1,470 kinds that they have supposedly on board the Ark, uh, an amazing, whoop, uh, getting feedback from somewhere or not on uh, here. Let me see uh, whether or not I've got, uh, whoops. I'm not hearing a feedback. I'm not hearing it either. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I think we're probably, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not getting, um, uh, I, I've got my thing on mute. So I'm not, anyway, 54% um, uh, of the kinds by their reckoning were forms that are now extinct. Oh, so oops. as a, as a preserving life on, on the arc thing, it's a manifest oh. failure. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just, I, I'm just envisioning it of like, if all the kinds on the arc survived, you would need what is it like 11 or 15 new species a day from just the kind that was there from the numbers they yeah. give it's if i'm Apple pretty clear went out, that's even worse for them for the birds for the birds it looks like they're relying on leitner her analysis where she came up with about 170 some odd kinds uh so they're they're in that area there's another one where i'm pretty sure marcus ross uh was the source for their amphibian kinds which looks like it's at the family level other ones it looks like they're not operating at the family level they're actually more cl closer to the genus level because they got way too many kinds based on just families so um uh it'll be fun to try to figure out they've never posted the list at aig i wonder why uh and therefore we can't see the documentation of how they came up with their bloody numbers now ironically there's another site uh, another posting at aig that lists their kinds 
uh, independent of the Ark Encounter, and they came up with an 8500 number. Yeah. So it would be fun to compare one creationist with another <laughs> as to how many kinds there were. So yeah. I'll, I'll be ongoing on that. But anyway, it's a general shout out. If anybody has a high resolution photograph of the chart of the kinds from the Ark Encounter Museum, one that's better than the one that they have at their website to where if you zoom in on it, you can actually read what the words are. Uh, let me know. Or if, you, if anybody finds a list that somebody has compiled of it anywhere. I haven't found anything online yet, although I, 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 don't, I don't do diligent study on that at the moment. But at any rate, if anybody has some information on it, um, please let me know because I'd really love to replace my reptile number one, reptile number two, reptile number three uh, with uh, the actual names of the supposed kinds. And then you can track down whether or not it's justified to be able to do that, particularly the synapsids, because they've got a bunch of synapsid kinds in there, and there's only been one baromenology study, as everybody who's read my book uh, would know. And so where are they getting their numbers from on this? <laughs> yeah. And I was going to say, and even their own Bible specifies that it's at the species level, because they sent out a dove, and I think a raven is the other one. Um, and yeah, they don't talk they, about they, – they never – all of the animals, there's actually, I, I seem to think, I, I, um, I, I'm pulling this number just out of memory, but I seem to think that the analyses are that there's only a few hundred animals that are mentioned in the Bible. And they're yeah. all very familiar farmyard animals, the sort of things, or the mythical ones like Leviathan and, and Behemoth, uh, that are ones that, that, that they would have encountered in their natural course of events. They're not anything that are, you know, when they talk about Adam naming animals, uh, there's no listing of them. So we don't know what name An uh, Adam gave to an echidna. <laughs> I'd love to know that, frankly. But anyway, so off on, uh, we'll leave the ark behind and we'll go to the exciting Adam. world of, of the um, I, I know he uh, would have named it book. A, he would have named it a four-headed monster. <laughs> Anybody who knows echidna biology will laugh at that joke. Ha 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 ha! Oh come on, Jackson! That was a good one. I'm sorry. I mean, I, it was pretty funny. Yeah. Now then, so one of the things that uh, has popped up, and I'll probably have to do another little screen share in here. Uh, I think I fell down. I'm an old fart, and I'm tired today. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm trying to do with what I can. Um, I, I've been able to find an awful lot of source material. Um, there's very sources of internet. One of the uh, state, our, our Rupi and Sanford gang are, um, uh, <laughs> I guess I, I can see Robert Richardson's over there. Man, this was a tough call. Non sequitur had a good pair on. Well, uh, you'll have to watch them later, Robert. Thank you for showing up in here. And uh, I would have been okay if you had wanted to watch them live and then watch me uh, later on. But anyway, um, in our little show uh, at the uh, the Sanford uh, story, uh, they happen at one point, they're talking about um, erectus morphology, and their argument is that Homo erectus is just deformed people, and just as Neanderthals were just unusual people, and every attempt to make them really wow. different from us, yeah, yeah, are that's so that's a jaw drop. Right? Are, they, is, are they trying to argue like, like the the further you get away from humans in human ancestry, they just get more and more deformed. Like Homo habilis is the most deformed human. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that they're that they're if they're next to the 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 God of Abraham enclave uh, uh, that they're yeah. not specific about. Uh, everybody farther outside of that can become kind of deformed, inbred populations. But anyway, the sentence that really struck me. Uh, was this paleoanthropologists have long acknowledged that the morphological boundary between erectus and homo sapiens is arbitrary and quote not clearly oh. demarcated unquote. oh and this God. was taken from a 1990 uh, book which fortunately i was able to see the text in question when i looked it up on amazon and so i hand copied out let me um do my little screen share here again and uh um, yeah. bing I mean, I'll just say this. And so yeah, now I'm, you should be seeing uh, this material, Wright Meyer, G. Philip, The Evolution of Homo Erectus. Whoops, I left out a T in there. Whoop. Yeah, and, I, I, um, I was going to say that the saying that Homo Erectus is just as is just deformed people is about as bad as the jokes I've been using whenever you mention it, going, hee, hee, 
he said erectus. That's about how bad mm -hmm. that argument is. It's about as bad now, as that look Down here, I discovered this is the paragraph that this was from, and I'll say, I'll say similar reasoning has been extended to the hominids. Many workers frame the later history of this group as one of the gradual divergence of two major lineages after splitting from a common ancestor in the Pliocene. One lineage containing species of Australopithecus is presumed to have become extinct, while the second is thought to have produced successive species of the genus Homo, including modern humans. Within this second lineage, three species are recognized, but the boundaries between Homo habilis and Homo erectus, or between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens are not clearly demarcated. Oh. Cambridge 1979 describes such species as arbitrarily divided segments of an evolving lineage that differ morphologically from other species in the same or different lineages. Oh. So what they're... So I have a question. They're, they're, uh, yeah. uh, so this is a 1990 book. Did they not think to look at any of the new, more recent, you know, really cool oh, studies that we've done gosh, on genetics? No. I'll, be, I'll be getting on to that well, momentarily. I mean, so they were um, misquoting an issue of chrono species, basically. Yeah, and Completely also the fact that this was this guy was summarizing one of two positions, and he wasn't claiming that, that this was in the old thing between the out of Africa versus the multi-regional model that was still a going concern in the 1980s, which would have been reflected in this 1990 book. But the last, the next paragraph down, the one that spills over into the next page, um, it was revealing that they obviously didn't read. Other workers generally agree with the partitioning of Homo into three species, but place more emphasis on the gradual nature of evolutionary advance. Cronin et al. 1981 have reviewed much of the Pliopleistocene hominid evidence and have concluded that fossils displaying the intermediate morphology are fairly numerous. Such transitional individuals are said to be common in the European Middle Pleistocene, and the material from Petrolona and other localities is used to support a claim for steady change in the populations linking late Homo erectus with early Homo sapiens. And so what we've got here Hilarious. is a reflection of, yeah. um, oh, good gravy, did I, there we go. I always have to go navigating around to find, there we go. Um, this is basically this spectrum problem that the kinds of ones who regard Homo erectus and Homo sapiens as just a graded species aren't claiming that Homo erectus at this end is not very different from Homo sapiens down at this end, only that it's a continuous grade. And so if they want to regard them as incipient Homo sapiens at some point, find it handy. Whereas your, your splitters will be tending to regard these down here as very distinctive and then quibble over the transition node as you start moving into here. So this is a matter of systematics and it's a, it's a matter of perspective. And Rupi, who is just hunting for authority quoting, uh, is missing that like mad. He's constantly... <laughs> slice he's doing is looking for authority quotes in this case one phrase that when you read the entire did not in fact uh support the position that he was dealing with it happened over and over again uh 50 percent of the book so far is just authority quoting and in one case on this particular section he literally uh, authority quoted this 1981 work which was a thing on the 1970s a symposium, and he puts the same note and same quote in the notes on two successive pages. He double dips. He's just waving the same material and, and manages to forget to copy identically on each one of the versions. So he manages to make a typographical error uh, between the two. Um, one of the links that I put up was to the um, uh, um, uh, uh, Charles Choi article um, regarding this Lord Kindapadzi. Uh, paper in the science magazine and what was fascinating about it is not only did they f misrepresent the guy's name uh, they listed him as mr. Charles comma CQ and, and, and they aren't even reading their own secondary source accurately but here you had not one not two but three different sources that they were citing that was all talking about this technical paper and they never bothered to cite the technical paper yeah so I put links up to the paper and to the uh, commentary by Schwartz, and you can see the il illustrations and stuff in there, and to Choi and all of the other ones that they were citing. Uh, so you can see what the data field are, and you can see that no, the Homo erectus and the Deman, Deman, Demansi, uh man that they're talking about, Demanisi, uh, aren't normal human beings. They may be seen on a spectrum if you're a, a, a lumper, <laughs> but it's, it's yeah. not the same. And so they're, they're, they're never citing 
uh, for data content. They're citing for authority quotes, uh, and supposedly they're going to argue later on in the chapter that uh, all of these characteristics that are seen in Homo erectus are just natural variations in human beings and that they can prove it. Well, yeah. we'll see. Well, I was going to point out something that was talking about it and what they did. Robert brings up a very good point. He goes, dishonest quote money from creationists? Say it ain't so. I go, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. I am absolutely shocked they would do that. that no that's sarcasm one of the in my voice. It's one of the uh, yes. I'll, I'll get the trial out and uh, and uh, scoop it up. Uh, the uh, the the thing is that um, this is a pathology of behavior in anti evolutionism. That in the tip project I'm measuring, and remember I'm the only one that's measuring this crap. So please support the project so I can keep doing this. Um, Ninety five percent of anti evolutionists don't cite primary sources. They simply repeat tropes. And of the ones who do cite primary sources, technically Rupri and Sanford are citing primary sources. An awful lot of those are just for authority quotes or misrepresenting their content. So if you actually get down to the core groupings of data field, you've got a ridiculously small field of people, only about 50, who are actually trying to make um, technical arguments based on technical information, and they're not doing a very good job of it as it is. So that yeah. secondary addiction thing, where they're, they're grabbing it at straws, uh, what fascinated me on the, on the next page is they had a bunch of quotes. There was one from this Gabriel Lasker um, from 1973 on Homo erectus. And then the next one, they have Milford Wolpoff, of course, was one of the, and still is one of the major advocates of uh, the multi regional approach uh, to things, which again, it's that how you treat that spectrum of data. Uh, and it was from 1984. Like Wolpoff has been in a hole over the last 30 years and isn't still active in writing. Uh, so the, the reliance on really dated material as if it was reflective of uh, deep positions and not explaining the reasons why, as that uh, um, Reitmeier quote was, uh, the, the methods approach here is really easy because I'm a guy with no budget at all. So I'm able to track down primary source material and read the original material. Science Magazine, for example, commentaries that are made on their papers in the journal are always free, full text. So you can literally read the original material, even if sometimes you can't read the original paper because it's behind a firewall. But you can find the text somewhere else, which is what I did in my link. Ah, going to go for it. Hi, Peter. Evening all. Yes, it's, he's, he's in Europe. So it's uh, actually uh, in the wee hours of the morning so, uh, over in there. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I was, was going to say what, I don't remember what it was. It was dealt with that. Oh, well, you're, you're having brain farts like me, but doing yeah. it early. I think well, that is – oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, well, I am the second uh, oldest person. Uh, I don't know about now, but – Yeah, they, they might have me beat on it, or maybe not. And they just disappeared. I think that – I mean, you, you know, you're not, you're not uh, winning by very much. Also, you're still not very old, so <laughs> – well, I'm the second oldest person in Every, this room. Okay? Everybody You're can, the have, youngster. can have brain farts on things, which is why sound yeah. method is so important. Uh, you don't want to rely on your memory for everything. You want to yeah. be able to have uh, a groundings in primary source information that you can link to directly rather than to have a secondary analysis. Secondary analyses can often be extremely useful. Carl Zimmer is a perfectly great example, and, and Brian Nash and uh, various ones who do magnificent secondary analysis as well as primary source work in the case of Nash. He's been published in technical journals. Uh, and they give you a, a good skivvy on things. But if you're going to get serious in, in debating or analyzing any um, uh, hypercritics like creationists, uh, the more you can ground your argument in primary source material, the better. And so what you can do um, on, on papers that you read in creationist journals and, and papers you read in regular science journals, they've got references, they've got sources you can follow up. If you say, oh gosh, I don't understand that. Well, there's the source they're citing. I can look that source up. Now you can look at the primary material. All of that process is going to improve your analysis because you can measure what you understand and what you don't uh, and gradually work your way through to where you do understand it. That gives you greater confidence. It gives you a greater data field that you can rattle off much more readily because it's in your immediate map of time uh, memory palace in a way that it isn't if you're just repeating the tropes that you get from uh, people who tell you what you want to be true. 
So uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a giant advocate of source methods approach, not merely as a, as a handy way to criticize people, but as a learning tool, because that's how I've learned. Yeah. Uh, when I first started out the projects, very little was available online. And I was coming at it at um, the kind of National Geographic level um, of um, yeah. secondary analysis. And um, I look back on those times where I go, oh, boy, I didn't know a lot. Yeah. But now I can know a lot. There's... And and it's just a matter of filling things down. And um, if, if there's terminology you don't understand, uh, look it up, check it out. Uh, oh, uh, Peter. Hello, Peter. Hey, Peter. Hi, James. See, mm -hmm. hello. See, see what you did there. <laughs> if, if, you, if, you, if you say creationist and uh, um, um, authority oh. in one sentence three times, that's what. Yes, yes. It's like it's like Beetlejuice. Yeah. Juice, yeah. 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 Well, well, and there are get... they're from a. Uh, oh, uh, Robert Richardson is asking uh, me, uh, how do they get away with claims like within the range of normal human morphology? Show me one human being with an H. erectus mandible chin where. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to be looking for. What I, I did uh, glance through the rest of the chapter, uh, just at the footnotes, to see whether or not they ever did cite that da da damned uh, Lordekin Podsey paper. And they never did. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, I'll be measuring, because I've already seen how quickly... Rupee plays fast and loose with data field and how um, uh, there's other examples that I've discovered that I think he's getting some of his material from Marvin Lubinow. He's trawling yeah. sources. There are several examples of, of quotes that he's put up where he has no page numbers. Uh, they're from a, a, a large book. Where would you find that from? I think he's and, and it turns out they popped up in Lubinow's apologetics. So I think he uh, is doing an awful lot of secondary source scavenging. Which is the dead? This is the this is the great sin of bad scholarship, is yeah. when you cite somebody that is cited directly by somebody, full text or footnoted, however one they want to look at it, but you steal that as if you've read it yourself. Uh oh! The yeah. moment you do that, you are bad dog. You have yeah. suddenly jumped off the the methods bandwagon. The but moment you, you treat a secondary source uh, as if you have read it as a primary source without fact checking it yourself uh oh you know why they do that right yeah i mean oh, but, if, well, if, they're, if they're going to go to to the original papers they'll have to debunk real science yeah and yeah. since since that's impossible uh for them uh they can't go to the original papers well it's it's, it's more subtle than that peter because I see this behavior an awful lot, and um, uh, Jackson and I both have seen it in Dinesh D'Souza. It's the, the, the desire for the object that says what you want to be true. And once you get that, that it's very easy to simply pick that up and import it. And it makes you feel uh, as though you have done the work yourself. Richard Milton, uh, if, for those of you who haven't read uh, Dynomania, um, please read Dynomania because there's an awful lot in there about me source methods and particularly Richard Milton, who is my poster child for scholarly incompetence. <clears throat> he is addicted to secondary sources on a catastrophic scale. It's hilarious how easily he will vacuum up stuff from other people as if he had read them himself when it was patently clear that he hadn't. And yeah. it shows up again and again and again. And because this guy is not a creationist in the conventional sense, he's not religious, he had a science background. He's uh, kind of on the more liberal spectrum. He's one of the rare examples of that in some ways. But he's also a complete scholarly nebbish. Uh, he's terrible at it. And you can see it again and again and again in his source-based usage. So um, all you have to imagine is that kind of behavior popping up in other contexts where um, um, uh, the, the parasitical cider has options when they're stealing. Uh, if the person is citing a secondary source, they may be wary of it because of that. They want to have a primary source, so they will cite the secondary source as a secondary source and feel happy with it. That's what Dinesh did with this uh, Margaret Sanger quote that he nicked from uh, the creationist Weikert. Uh, but yet, later on, he's got the Papineau and Johnson quote. Uh, where, uh, and Jackson and I did a whole video on this, so if you want the linkage on that, we can, uh, we had a nice chat about it. Anyway, uh, those Papineau and Johnston thing where, where Dinesh cited the primary source. Now, it's possible he had nicked that secondarily from somebody else, or he 
actually did get the original material and doesn't know how to read. Okay. Uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. but, but all of that is that kind of behavior pops up in secondary source addicts, that they have objects of desire that they want to be true, and they only go to the point where they find the thing that reinforces what they want to be true, but they don't look any farther than that. Yeah, and it's, it's a weird behavior. Yeah, I was going to say, I was looking at the chat, and uh, Robert said something. He says, I pulled up um, JPEGs of H. erectus skulls, and I'm picking out numerous major morphological differences that aren't found on any H. sapiens anywhere. Are these people blind? No, yeah. their Bible cannot be wrong. That's it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and here we're dealing with um, uh, the, the, the one that's going to be really fascinating. And, I, and by the way, Jack, and do a quick look through the, uh, um, uh, the A. Sediba chapter. They do not cite wood. The creations. Oh, sad Isn't that astonishing? I'm, Isn't that astonishing? I'm going to have to go cry that, now. Their already. own side has done an analysis of, of the very topic they are discussing, and they are afraid to cite it. Well, it, I mean, they didn't even try to cite, like, Denton, or Denton, uh, Menton, who was, like, against the study. They didn't cite anything. Well, I, I, well, I, didn't, I didn't spot any there, there, but I haven't done the full analysis on ah, that okay. yet. The only creationist they've cited so far is Lubinow. Uh, and they've done so repeatedly. Well, And he... I suspect it's due to Rupi. See, S Sanford, in his introduction, uh, admits that Rupi did the legwork. He was the one that uh, constructed all that. Oh, uh, Robert Richardson says, almost forgot to tell you, I put in a request for the Kansas City Public Library System to order copies of your slam dunk. Thank you, Robert. We'll keep us informed yeah. as to whether or not that works out or not. Uh, if you do, then I will be a happy camper. If not, I will be a less happy camper. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I remember one of the points I was going to say. Um, and what, uh, oh, oh. Go, go ahead, Jackson. Oh, I was going to say, oh. uh, doesn't Lube now uh, often uh, skirt the fossil data? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a bunch of stuff on Lubinow in uh, the Planet of the Apes chapter, and that was based on his older material, and he hasn't yeah. gotten any better yeah. uh, was, since then. Uh, was Lubinow the I did for the giraffe video that you pointed me to about the, the giraffe neck? Uh, oh, no, no, no. That's uh, oh, uh, uh, Lunig. Oh. Um, yeah, he's an intelligent design guy, quirky little fellow. No, Marvin Lubinow is an old-style young earth creationist, and he, he's been busy for decades. I mean, he's, he's a major one in there. And um, he is um, uh, highly regarded in creationist circles. He gets riffed on a lot. So uh, anybody who wants to knock down paleoanthropology uh, mythologies from the, uh, in the creationist uh, literature, Lubinow is an excellent place to start because he's relied on a lot. Uh, yeah. as an authority figure it, and what i was going to point out was um i remember what i was going to say um it was i was going to reference something that Aaron ross always says of with the whole you know secondary quoting and, and not citing sources or, or not having primary sources and technical papers to back them up as Aaron says and this is one of my favorite lines to use whenever you get in an argument and someone wants to make a claim if you can't show it you don't know it no, yeah, and and the uh, the um, James Burke corollary: if you can't explain it to somebody, you don't understand it. Yep. So that's why questions are quite useful, and it's a good way of, of keeping you on your own guard. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, it's the case where people ask me things. I'm not bad at explaining stuff, I think, uh, and so it's because I I, I kind of understand it. So um, it's not something where I have to scavenge around. And it's in a debating context you'll find that it, it's so much better if you know your stuff. And if you're, if you're planning on taking on Wooists, you want to read their stuff too or see their videos. You want to know their material better than they do so yeah. that they can't hide behind their apologetics. Um, the, the, the reason why I love throwing the reptile mammal transition at people is because I'd studied the whole bloody thing. And so um, uh, it uh, gives me a confidence level because I literally know everything they could possibly throw at me. And, yep. and because I know so much of it isn't available online, the, the amount of stuff that you could get online is so limited that it's it's pre-filtered for you. So you can be waiting, yeah. okay, are they going to cite Doyle or are they going to try to throw Woodmarab at me? Hmm, let yeah. me see. Or maybe there's the old Gish. And so uh, and, and they'll be restricted by the limitations of their own source material because you'll know what they've discussed and what they haven't in a way that they can't figure out because they'd have to read the original material and they won't.
<laughs> yeah, I I am still trying to figure out how people can take Dwayne Gish seriously after his fire breathing dragon fiasco <laughs> comment. I just oh, I, yeah. When when I was at uh, uh, Mike Riddle, uh, who I think Jackson has heard of too. He's he's, he's yeah. I've actually, uh, I know someone who knows him, and we've t- we're trying to get him on my channel. I guess I haven't heard anything from him recently. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, 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 here's another one for uh, Steve McCray to arrange a debate with. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he hasn't got me debating me, uh, Ken Hovind, and I've been wanting to do that as well. But anyway, I, I Mike Riddle if, is. A, uh, uh, I'll just say, I don't know if Kent's going to go back on there. I mean, he's after the roast. <laughs> uh, he seemed to have an f- issue with that, and then after Aaron just. <laughs> just hey, trashed well, why wouldn't he want to debate me? I'm just a pathetic old little evolutionist guy from Spokane, whereas he is the fabulous Kent Hoven with it. He's a doctor. Yeah. yeah. RJ, see, that's the thing. You may play off as this, this innocent old man character, but anyone who watches you knows that's not anywhere close to being true. You will, <laughs> see, you're the person who will take, who will go rip their arm off, slap them with their own arm, smiling at them going, why you're hitting yourself? Why you're hitting? That is you. That's you in a debate. <laughs> you're the guy who says, oh, oh dear, you're not even wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Mike Riddle is, uh, back to Mike Riddle. Uh, Mike Riddle is an apologist for Answers in Genesis. He's a secondary redactor. I know by directly asking him when he was up here, oh, I was thrilled when, when Answers in Genesis finally came to Spokane. This was about, oh gosh, 2009 maybe? It's been a, it's been a few years. Anyway, uh, we're, we're usually off the beaten track on the apologetic circuit for the higher echelon gang. And uh, so I was delighted that they went up to one of our little mega churches here and uh, I came to visit him. He was very affable. Uh, he, he had no problem uh, having chit chats with me and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he thought he was way more knowledgeable than he actually was. But I, I determined when I was quizzing him on some of the stuff that he was literally capable of citing a secondarily obtained technical paper without ever bothering to read it. And at that point, he's just jumped off the methods bandwagon. The moment you cite a technical work that you've obtained secondarily and you never bother to check out whether or not it says what the person says it does. In this case, Andrew Snelling, it was a thing on diamonds, diamond dating, uh, that um, Snelling was misrepresenting the source. And uh, that was painfully obvious. And uh, and um, uh, the other fun part was that um, he had put up, Riddle had put up a lot of his debates or lectures up as PowerPoints on their website. So I was able to find out most of what he was going to say before he even bothered to say it. And of course, his audience was credulously in, in his favor. It was one of these kind of upscale, mega mall kind of, of uh, churches these days. It had its own food court and uh, beautifully decorated uh, with slate stuff. And it was very, very nice. And a big rock concert thing so they could have uh, amplifiers and all that for, for, for the sinful rock music that everybody's adopted lately. But anyway, um, the audience was very much on his side. And um, uh, quite a few were just taking umbrage when I was criticizing Dwayne Gish. Why won't you tell the, the man to his face? Well, I'd be happy to. So I actually emailed him and never got an answer. This was just, uh, he, he had, um, died shortly thereafter that. So it had, it's been quite a few years ago. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, I have absolutely no respect for Dwayne Gish as a scholar. He is the, I have great admiration for his ability as an apologist, that there are very few people who were as good at parsing sources uh, than Dwayne Gish. He could manipulate and massage and tweak and pick just a little snippet out to look what he wanted to have. Uh, there's very few people who are were skilled at that as Dwayne Gish was. He also, ironically, was very uncomfortable defending young earth creationism. He tended not to do it. He would just sidestep the subject. His forte was paleontology, uh, he thought. Uh, as a biochemist, he was not terribly good at either. And, um, uh, and so there were lots of examples of Dwayne Gish's incompetence that I had documented in the old book. And then I got even deeper into some of that stuff for Slam Dunk, where it just makes it look even worse. So anybody who could take Dwayne Gish seriously uh, can't be taken seriously by definition, period. Uh, let me put up my cute little... Um, um, I, I actually, plug here. I watched a few, uh, um, early in my YouTube career, I watched a few, uh, little videos by Mike Riddle and they are just hilariously bad. 
Yeah. Like uh, he, he's he a said, lower echelon redactor. He very seldom writes well, I mean, anything. He's he just did basically one, a lecturer. He did one where he was talking about natural selection and he said nature is intelligent because only intelligence can select. Oh my god. Clearly yeah, I, someone yeah. needs to explain oh, like wow. permeable I, I, membranes I, I, and enzymes I, to him. Uh, Oh, <laughs> yeah, I uh, I put up my um, uh, tip patrons there, uh, Stephen and Dyer and Eat and Yui and Mona and Hendrel and Jen and Jody and Daniel and Ralph and Eric and I, Benjamin and Staggles and Alex and Totus Real and Everett and Paul. Thank you all. Uh, here again is my website. Uh, there is the Patreon, although I must, uh, in a matter of uh, public record, point out that, boy, they're slow as molasses on getting money to me. Whereas uh, if you really uh, love this project and want to pump in with five bucks or whatever and get all of your friends to do the same, go find me dot com DC go. Please, please, please. OK, there's my shameless plug. Uh, and we'll get back to the. Uh, um, the world of discussion. Yeah. Riddle yeah, I, is um, one of the lower echelon. Yeah, go ahead, Cap. Oh, I was just going to say something to Jackson on what he said about the guy who said that only intelligence can select. For just how dumb that argument is, that statement is, just on, a, on face value how dumb that is, I have a question. How can he choose words to speak if only intelligence can select? <laughs> Well, <laughs> yes, as uh, as uh, a line from uh, Return to Oz said, you know, that a lot of people are perfectly capable of, of speaking without a brain, uh, uh, without any difficulty. Um, uh, Riddle is um, a perfectly fine exemplar of a very ebullient and overconfident apologist who operates at the secondary level. Like to where he's them? never done any. Yeah, well, no, there, there's, never... a, there's a pecking order. I a mean, pecking I... I rarely meet apologists who do not act like they know more than me about the subject. Oh, well, that's true. And, yeah. I, and, and I have no problem with that per se, because I think I act like I know more than most people. So uh, um, the, there, there you go. That doesn't James, bother me. James, but it's like James, Cap said, James, if you James, can't show it, you don't know it. You know? <laughs> I, 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 I James, that's, to... that's a fault. James, that's yeah, a let, fault. Peter, 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 jump in. That, that's a false analogy. You can't act like you know more than other people because you know more than other people. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's oh, shucks. Possible. I mean, yeah. But, but anyway, but there I, is three I have, to, I have to agree. I have to agree with, with Jackson. I haven't met an apologist who wasn't confident. Um, yeah. Yeah, they start talking and, and then they realize, oh, no. Yeah, yeah you don't, you don't but, find a timorous apologist that by definition. They're certain of what they're saying, and they're confident enough to go at it yeah. all guns blazing. Yeah. But that is, it's completely easy to be confident if you're a creationist because you don't have to learn anything. You just no. have to regurgitate what you read on creationist websites, and you're as smart as any professor uh, yeah. you'll ever come across. Yeah, and, that, so, and, that, and that's why Milton, the Milton case is so revealing because he doesn't have a religious axe to grind. But he's displaying all the same behavioral traits. He can suck up information from Velikovsky or Henry Morris or other secondary sort, or Thomas Kuhn for that matter, uh, and act as if he understood it, act as if he had imbued its knowledge firmly or had fact checked any of it. And once you have a mind that can do that, even if you're relatively bright, uh, and the brightness actually reinforces it because you're fast at stealing other people's information without ever fact checking it. That's when you can really slide off the rails. I'd put it as, a, as a, a pecking order though, in terms of scholarly method. At the top, you have somebody like Todd Wood, who is actually a remarkably careful scholar. And he actually does kind of let the chips fall where they may. He's a doctrinal young earth creationist and nothing can ever dissuade him of that. But he's the one who will freely admit that no evolution is not a theory in crisis. Uh, there's tons of evidence for evolution and so forth and so on. And so he uh, uh, is, is in many respects a very fair level one. Then you've got your um, uh, more ax grinding ideologues. Uh, Andrew Snelling would be an example of that. Good gravy, that guy cites a lot of technical literature. And uh, um, this, uh, the, the, the big stacks of material that I have to go through to do a source analysis on his stuff is really laborious. And it's in part a barrage where he's, he's slamming out all of this material and it gives the impression that it's better documented than it is. So that's why you have to tra track through to where you find the litmus test points, the nodes where the actual contentious information is being discussed 
and see whether or not that bears out. Well, all of the pile of additional material doesn't save it if he suddenly says something completely stupid or completely uh, untenable, which is what I'm getting into then on this Sanford and Rupee book, where um, there's an awful lot of boilerplate. And so they're and, a pr and promissory notes of what they're going to show. And I'll see in due course to whether or not they actually can make good on it. I'm suspecting they can't because they're going to have to make the data appear what it isn't. But th the act of whether or not they actually follow through on that, Dwayne Gish would do these promissory notes. Uh, there's a thing where uh, I've alluded to, uh, I think I, I mentioned it in Slam Dunk, where he was promising to discuss punctuated equilibrium. And then he continually said, I'm going to discuss punctuated equilibrium. And then he actually didn't get around to discussing punctuated equilibrium. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. That happened to me recently. You saw my index fossils video, or I, I gave you the script for the index fossils video. That was hilarious. Mm. Oh my gosh. I <laughs> laughed so hard reading wow. that article because they <laughs> forgot to discuss index fossils. Yeah. The, the, uh, I, I think oh the best God. thing I've ever had happen to me is I got into it with a, uh, with a creation of some kind, I don't remember who it was, but it was someone. And I just sat there and I was just sitting there like, yeah, yeah, okay. Finally, I'm like, all right, my turn. And I started addressing their point. And each point, I had a source. I had a, I tried to find a technical paper or something that was from a highly respected university, something that I could cite. And I backed up every point. Their response immediately after, like, I mean, like, Two minutes after I sent them, I had about 15 links, so there's no way they went through them all, even read the abstract of them mm -hmm. all. Their response, and I quote, I remember it very distinctly, you are just citing of the, your citation is of the devil because it's not, it does, it denies what God's word says. Perfect. And, and, like, and there it is. Wow. It's very old, old Scratch brings up a, a wonderful point in there. Uh, uh, in the live chat, whenever they tell me that they know more about evolution than me, then the next words out of their mouth are evolution says the cows turned into whales and dogs turned into horses yes. and frogs turned into oh, blah, blah. Amen. Uh, now that, that cows turning into whales one is a diagnostic. That one's a really a, a gangplank issue, a litmus test element, because the cows turning into whales is an old Dwayne Gish trope. Yeah. And there's the famous picture of a, of a cow or, or a whale with a, a cow's udder on the back end of it. It was a, a oh, before Photoshop and it was just yeah. an artistic rendition. Have you seen the ones but with the, like the lizards that become a rabbit or the lizard that becomes a rabbit? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, there's, there's several different ones that it's popular. These are the chimera approach to, yeah. to evolution. But the, yeah. about the, 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 um, the bits about the um, uh, dogs into horses we know that one is belied by the creationist's own work that we now know that todd wood and that little bunch had had went through and did a baromenology analysis of the horse sequence and they decided that all of the ones from heracotherium all the way through dinohippus mesohippus all the way up to um uh, equus are a quote monobaromen and that means they are in a naturally evolved lineage within a hypothetically larger kind. In other words, that, that the creationists have conceded the horse sequence, the horse evolution sequence. Now, most creationists don't know that because they don't read many creationists. But they don't follow the literature. Creationists accept transitional fossils. Don't you know this? Oh, God. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Dr. Jensen. Yes, that's another one that just absolutely dropped yeah, the, the mouth on. So there's another point about why. Uh, uh, being aware of the history of creationism is really important because uh, when Jensen comes up and says, oh, we've always accepted transitional forms, you're going, what? No, no you haven't. No. Or, or the bits where they try to co-op. I've had discussions with various people uh, about the, the, the Empologia, I think, uh, was another one that I uh, called attention to this too, is the, the modern creationists accept plate tectonics. But creationism didn't start out accepting no. tectonics. They denied <laughs> continental drift like the plague. And, and that's the thing that I always find funny is people like AIG and a lot of the young earth creationists go, well, we believe what the Bible says and we'll never change our views on it, yet go back 20, 30 years and they were denying the stuff they're now accepting. And, and I have to say they, the, they the, greatest, the, the greatest – argument against evolution and i i think this person might have been a troll but it would not surprise me if someone actually believed this with how insane some people's beliefs are 
But I think they were trolled because of their argument. Because I got into an argument about a year and a half ago on Twitter. I don't even remember who it was with. It was another young Earth creationist. Um, and someone tried arguing because I, I had posted a, uh, a um, something doing with Pokemon. And they literally thought the evolution of Pokemon was evolution itself. <laughs> And anybody who knows what Pokemon is, yeah, you could. Yeah, you could the, uh, another one that pops up in the intelligent design literature is the Corvette case. Uh, there was a, a, a an anti creationist who had used uh, the the air quotes evolution of of um, uh, Corvettes over years as a way of illustrating taxonomic shifts <clears throat> to show how different character states alter over time. And it, you could argue, of course, the. Corvettes are designed objects, thank you very much. But the point is, is the Corvettes didn't jump abruptly to one thing or another. They were taking place as incremental adjustments. And that was the only point at which he was using the analogy. And Philip Johnson and others have just gone ballistic over it because they're arguing that, they, no, they're attempting to make an analogy between a design system and an undesigned system. And this completely blows their argument to smithereens. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I love the design one because that that is just so... Because, again, if you want to argue design, then all you have to do is find one flaw. One flaw, and their whole argument falls apart from an intelligence standpoint. Because no intelligent designer would ever allow a mistake in their drawing. I, I know I reference this a lot, but it's a very good example of a mistake in a drawing <laughs> where, it, it, where it had a catastrophic failure and why mistakes <clears throat> cost lives. Kansas City Skywalk. 1972, I believe. Yeah. It was in the 1970s. Over 100 people, I believe, died in that. I, yeah, if you don't think mistakes cost lives in design work, go talk, go look yeah, at that. The, 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 it's it's yeah. still... Yeah, jump yeah, in, Peter. That's, that's an argument you can't use anymore because they have the perfect cop-out, the fall. Everything was perfect. Well, that is true. Right. Right. And, and you can't designers. And you can't prove otherwise. You can't prove that. Oh, I, 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 I got a, I got a yak who tried to argue that on me. But before he even got the sin argument out, I got him to admit that his God put in a design flaw with the uh, digestive and respiratory system. I said, Do intelligent you design you advocates. Did this? Your, your, your Michael Behe types won't use the fall. As yeah. an example, so it's it's very much a doctrinal position. Uh, old Earth creationists will once in a while invoke it, but it's not a major issue for them. But it's it's an absolute litmus test. Young Earth creationists are addicted to it, and it's their get out of thinking free card. But yeah. but the argument that that a Behe will use is comparable to it. It's that nothing in design theory suggests that the design has to be perfect. Well, this is way beyond just not perfect. This is like, you know, uh, he, uh, be he, and I, I discussed this in another chapter to read, uh, the, the creationism like chapter from uh, Tip, where I went into a, a, his analysis where uh, he was arguing that uh, you, you, a parent doesn't have to give their kid the most expensive toy. That was the analogy that he was using. Well, no, this isn't an example of not giving you the most expensive toy. This is an analogy of somebody who gives you a toy that's got dangerous sharp edges that can cut your skin apart. Yeah. And so the, the, the Behe, because he doesn't allow that, in, when a push comes to shove, Behe is just as addicted to perfection as his opponents are, uh, conventional creationists. Because ultimately, it's very uncomfortable to imagine a designer making stuff that's kind of creepy, weird, and dangerous. Yeah. And so they tend to not think about all that stuff, which is why I love to bring up ALUs and uh, parasitical nematodes and all the other little fun and games to go on in there, which um, is uh, a, a bit. And their, their attempt to, to, to scavenge around it by just saying that um, the design doesn't have to be perfect. Um, there is the theodicy angle of a designed object. The moment it becomes a designed object, it is morally adjudicatable. You can consider whether it's a moral thing to do that or not. And and ironically, the design movement that's, that got into the business because they wanted morality and ethics and godly issues to be put back on the turf absolutely can't stand applying morality to biology. Yeah. yeah. It, <laughs> they they it, don't it want really to bring does. up any of that. Yeah, it, it, it it's raised the point of, like I said, the I, I would design it and, and 
Robert uh, said the designer screwed up on the most basic level in every single critter on the planet. Oops. And, and he's right. I mean, he did because in anyone I, I've noticed this people who argue design do not know design. It's relatively obvious. I mean, anyone who denies it, I, I mean, to me, people who deny evolution, I don't, I, I will say this. They're either liars or they have no clue about evolution. Like, Dr. Purdom from AIG. She's a good example. She knows what she's saying is a lie. She has to. Uh, well, no, no, no. Nope, nope, nope. Wait a minute. I have to. I have to jump in. Okay. Because I talked uh, to PZ Myers about this. Okay. And there's a perfectly good chance that she doesn't know what she's talking about. Well, Peter, here. Let me say this. I agree with what PZ is saying, but I also know that in doing what she does, she couldn't possibly have not run into counter arguments to her position. Yeah. So I know that if someone were to send her a technical yes, paper but... <clears throat> saying why this argument is wrong, she would okay. be able to see it, look at the materials and methods and whatever else and realize this my argument is wrong, but I'm not going to say it's wrong. I agree, yeah, and yeah. this is and this is and this is what I learned from from Karis. If you are in a religious position in in the same way that Georgia Purdom is, you will just skip that. You will just right. discard that and refuse to read it. And if you you happen to read parts of it, refuse to remember it. Right. It is yeah. it is completely it's, it's filtered it's, out. It, took in mindset. It's, you oh, see yeah, that all the time. Right. Anne Gager uh, over in Intelligent Design is in exactly the same mode. She has read material on the ALUs, forwarded me information on the ALUs, because when I was at that meeting uh, over in Seattle and that, I was having chit-chats with her about the ALUs. Um, that uh, For those of you who are not aware of it, you ought to be, because 10% of us is ALU. There's over a million and a half and growing copies. It's a retrotransposon, which is a little strip of RNA that says, copy me, copy me, copy me, copy me, copy me. And so it, duh, copies. And But it yeah. doesn't have a readme code. And so it gets copied, but it doesn't do anything most of the time. But however, it only takes one little point mutation to turn the lead string of it into a readme code. And at which point, most of the time, that's not a good thing <laughs> because yeah. you've got this ALU that's in the middle of a protein, a bunch of ALU copies, and it suddenly changes the folding of the protein, and now it's malfunctioning, and you get a disease from it. But in yeah. other areas, ALUs kicked in up in our brain, and some of the things are actually useful. So we, we have functional ALUs operating in our brain chemistry uh, uh, to this day. Uh, but yeah. there, there's um, a, the vast majority of ALUs that kick in are deleterious. And she just doesn't want to think about that. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, Robert points out another point that uh, is kind of what I was saying with she has, like I said, I would have to know what she's saying is wrong because she has the degree. She has to know it's wrong. It's just she is being dishonest and lying about it because she feels she has to for religious reasons. That's where I was getting with it. Cause uh, he, uh, cause he said, cause Robert said, I've read some of her papers and caught her in some extremely dishonest representations of genetics. She couldn't have passed junior level genetics and made those mistakes. She's a liar. And I, now he says ham and Hoven thinks they really believe they're, you know, their BS. And, but I, and I'll agree with them there. They, I mean, ham, he, I, I've said this. They're just all their PhDs are just incompetent. Prop up for him to just go. Hey, look at me! I got PhDs who agree with me, and that's you have, you, you have, to, you have to, you have to, you have to acknowledge that he just said not a liar on purpose. And there's yeah. a difference between lying and lying on purpose. Yeah, and that's yeah, and that, I, I don't, I don't even think Purdom is a liar on purpose she's the no. same once you what once you, here here's why here when you have a mind that sees the object of desire and everything that comports to that can be true and nothing that rejects it can be true and your brain will just insulate you from seeing anything that's outside of the rut 
It doesn't yeah. matter whether you got a PhD or not. It doesn't matter whether you're prone to footnoting or not. If you look at the methodology of that kind of a mindset, Michael Denton falls into exactly the same mindset that he literally stops thinking. He only skims the surface of information. And, yeah. and since it can never be the case that information can refute creationism, her brain will shut down at any point that conflicts with it. It could be information yeah. literally under her own nose. The brain won't allow her to see it. And yeah. so is that lying? My Tortukan model would suggest no. They, they actually just don't think about it. They're not thinking about things they don't want to think about. It's such a pervasive behavior. It's just a slightly different okay. kind because you would think somebody with the degree level that she is would have to have a mind different than that. And I go, no, you don't. I, I, right. th I still okay. I still think no, that you have to you have to approach she's... it from from a from a different different point of view. Um, okay. she, what what she's doing she's thinking that she's doing good that she's leading yeah. people to Christ with yeah. what she's doing and so she will gather every single bit of information that she can get to lead people to Christ because. Uh, her PhD is secondary to her beliefs, and that's what counts. Yeah, yeah. And so, was... so calling calling people liars. I mean, some of them really are. I I think are liars. I consider uh, Eric Hovind a liar. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I I, I think because he... because he has switched positions in order to make money, and so. <laughs> To me, to me, that's that's very clear that he's just in it for the money and just in it for uh, more followers. Uh, abandoning his father when uh, when he didn't look good when he was in prison, yeah, and going a completely different way, choosing a different Bible. I mean, if you your whole life have believed in one certain Bible, you cannot switch that yeah. easily as, as, oh, we, as we, we found the same sort of circumstance with uh, garner ted armstrong uh and uh the um the church that they were belonging belonging to the when, when you get monetary factors when you get personality generational yeah. conflict going on that accelerates the process yeah it, um it, but eric is exactly the same level of credulous git as er, yeah. as his dad is yeah, and I was going to clarify, um, Pertum, I guess lying is a, is a little bit stronger word. I, I would say um, it's more unwillfully lying instead of willfully lying because I don't think she's – she she knows what she's saying is wrong. She has to know that. But as far yeah, as that's her, that's the thing, she, she doesn't know that uh, Okay, because, because she's filtering out it, the facts that she needs – to realize that she's lying, yeah. so and she, she might not know that. Uh, and, and Peter, I was gonna say, if, I was getting to that point, um, because if she, she knows what she's saying is wrong, but her religious mindset, or as RJ calls it, her Tertukan mind, just does not allow those fat her her brain to accept those facts, and she just basically in one ear out the other. And yeah, we can see that examples of so it in, in the regular scientific community. So uh, Mark Hauser oh, was ahead. doing exactly the same level of uh, conclusions first data when convenient, and it got him into trouble eventually. So yeah. this is a generic concept. Is is the idea? I know it's really hard because when you look at, at the data and you're prone to looking at all the data field, <clears throat> it's hard to imagine that there are people who don't do that that they basically parse information as to its apologetic utility. And I kind of straddled that same boundary because before I learned sound methods, um, I was perfectly capable of doing that back in my uh, high school years and early college years. And I believe some really cockamamie wrong things. So in many respects, it's like the ex-evangelical uh, where you know what it was like to operate from the inside. So although there are examples of things where lying becomes or, or deliberate data suppression becomes really unavoidable. Uh, most of the time, it's just their natural Tartukan traits where they just shunt aside parts that are inconvenient. 
Yeah. Ooh, now, uh, Robert uh, Richardson uh, asks uh, an actual uh, to the point question here. Uh, yeah. So where exactly do they draw the line between the early Homo and late Australopithecines in terms of that's a human and that's not human? Yeah, uh, they're they're doing the storyline kind of backwards in the book to where they did uh, Neanderthal first and now they're doing Homo erectus. And let me look up the chapters uh, titles here uh, to read off. Uh, then there's going to be one on Homo florensis, the hobbit, uh, which is still skirting in the Homo erectus category. Then they go after the Australopithecines and Artipithecus, and then Homo habilis and Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi uh, come up the tail ends uh, later on. So that's a coming attraction that I'll be wanting to see that myself. Um, so far, they've been remarkably shy to mention diagnostics. And uh, this was uh, showing up in the Neanderthal case. Where, Are you like, surprised? The fact that the Neanderthals yeah, I, was I mean, say. remember the video I did, the source methods approach, of the article of the the four creationist articles that critiqued uh wood's paper on sediba uh two ignored all postcranial features uh one ignored all uh features that we share in common with uh with sediba and then the fourth one didn't even look at any features it looked at the method of comparing organisms yeah. by their similarities and differences altogether you know so yeah, and that's exactly the thing. So what if you want the right analogy, what you're looking for is the sound of flushing. You want to see what information are they acknowledging and what information are they flushing down the toilet. There was an example um, that came to mind about Philip Johnson. Philip Johnson is uh, not a stupid guy. Got into Harvard when he was 16. He was basically the guy that jump-started the entire intelligent design movement. Uh, and he had gotten religion and that was sort of the impetus of him going on. And he wrote the famous book, Darwin on Trial, and quite a few books after that. Uh, but in one of his later books, there happened to be a quote that he nicked from um, uh, uh, Steven Weinberg, the physicist. And I, I'm, I slipped past it the first time I'd read it. I didn't really bother because it was just a comment about the role of scientific method and skepticism and a few other things. And uh, it was only later on when I was looking for something else from that same book that I happened to be looking at the library and spotted this again. And by now I was really knee deep in source methods approach. And what struck me this time was that there was this long paragraph with a dot, dot, dot in the middle. And I'm going, why is there a dot, dot, dot in the middle of a page long paragraph? Why was this so long that they, it would have been two pages? It turned out one sentence had been removed, just one from that dot, dot, dot. And it was the sentence that blew the argument apart which it was that no theory, including Newton, ever explained everything. And it, in order for the argument that, that Johnson was taking, if you put that sentence back in, it meant that the skepticism that, that he wanted for Darwinism would apply to all of science. And he would just be flushing the last 400 years of science down the toilet. And yeah. he didn't want his readers to notice that. So out went that one little sentence surgically. It was the shortness of the sentence that meant it was a tactical maneuver. And you have to realize he was consciously deciding to remove that one little sentence in that little dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Scholarship is a contact sport. <laughs> and, and, and dot, dot, dots, um, uh, your ellipses, your uh, uh, italicizations, uh, like this bit about that three, uh, two words uh, that were uh, not clearly demarcated, three words that they nicked from a very long sentence and completely removes it from its context. Um, the vast majority of this behavior can be accounted for by people who are seeking to have things to reinforce what they want to be true. And so they're, they're looking for apologetic things. You're, the, the rare cases of like a Johnson, and there will be cases of Purdom and others uh, you you got to wonder what goes through uh, Jeffrey Tompkins's brain when he is aware of the technical information. Uh, those of you who have read Slam Dunk will have seen all of that sections that I did on Michael Denton and how he was dancing around technical information. You, ha you have to wonder again and again and again when he, he's so close to information, but yet it doesn't get on the page. He just walks past yeah. it. And, and that makes you realize you're getting underneath the hood of their brain. I'm I'm way reluctant to call it lying. It's something far more fascinating. It's a self-medication mode, a buffering mode, that Tortukan rut thing, to where I'm, I'm very reluctant to ever call anybody a lawyer because it's an unnecessary accusation to make. There are a few instances of where you can have things where you've got a, a piece of data selection so blatant that you can say this, 
either you're an idiot or you don't know how to read. Which one is it? And, yeah. and there you, you don't have to accuse them of lying. You can just have, there's a bad choice, neither one of which is a nice option, but that's mm -hmm. inevitable because of the content. Yeah. That, oh, uh, uh, Robert Richardson says uh, uh, that I might find it interesting to note that he won an argument with a creationist today by showing him a PubMed, PubMed article that was highly critical of all modern uh, origin of life chemistry models. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that uh, yeah. origin are bust as everybody knows that's the phrase i use and yeah. I, I please popularize it uh because it's it's yeah. the shorthand uh thing uh because it's uh, I, use it I think i did one of the earlier videos on it it's I a handy a... shorthand because what it is is they're trying to disprove evolution because of the origin of life but that doesn't make the data go away and it's usually a dodge they do and the other factor is that no anti-evolutionists do origin of life research as far as i know none uh, all they are are scavengers who hunt around to find authority quotes and bits. And the point is, is that the people most critical of origin of life researchers are origin of life researchers because well, they don't want to have an answer. They want to have the correct answer yeah. and they will therefore hold everybody, including themselves, to the highest of standards. There was just a matter of where Sostak uh, just retracted one of his papers that he had put in where they couldn't replicate it properly. And they and it, uh, and so they retracted it and the intelligent design people yeah. crowed about it and the creationists crowed about it aha see they're retracting their work well he hasn't retracted all of his work he was fair about the fact that they couldn't replicate this particular reaction that they had thought they had and they they go by the facts if only yeah. creationists retracted their stupidity well you know what's, what's really weird i think with regard to the origins or bust um i think it's really strange how the even like theistic evolutionist apologists will take things from creationism to fight abiogenesis. I think that's really bizarre. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, it, like it doesn't Craig surprise me. Guys. I, I, it, it, yeah, it doesn't surprise me because, well, there, there's that smorgasbord technique that, that there are people who want to have certain argumentative styles. And you'll find young earth creationists, for example, riffing off of an awful lot of the anthropic arguments, even though they're completely incompatible because they're based on standard cosmology. Yeah. Uh, Lord Quackle Squirrel. Hi there. Um, I see he's popped up in, into the field. It, uh, I still haven't figured out how do you put the little red background around things uh, on that. I don't know how to do that yet. That's one of the minor skill sets that I have. On, on what the name? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've uh, seen oh, that highlighter only, thing around it. I don't the know. highlighter only shows up on your name, so it grabs your attention that someone's talking to you. Oh, 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 okay. So, oh, well, thank you very yeah. much. That's important information yeah. to learn about. But uh, anyway, yeah, origins are bust. Uh, if you want a simple taxonomy of anti-evolutionism, it's really easy to remember. All anti-evolutionism argument is a god of the gaps. Yeah, You will find a bunch of people denying that, but in effect, when you look at the argument, it's, yeah. well, you Darwinists can't explain fill in the blank. Therefore, creation. Well, that's a God of the Gaps yeah, argument. I, I, <laughs> now, it splits into two subcategories. And the ones that are for the professionals is natural theology. This is part of its gee whiz, oh, look how complicated nature is, and uh, wonderful providential designs and all that kind of stuff. That argument will only go so far because eventually they start bumping into all the creepy fiddly bits, and it starts looking really not like providential design after all. And so they'll tend to back off of that and jump then to the default mode, which is where the, the amateurs go right away, which is origins or bust. So where did life come from? Where did matter come from? Where did the universe come from? Uh, well, Jim Sano. Uh, James, uh, James, uh, James, James, yeah. but, but, but we know where it came from. God made it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, I mean that's the short because, form. But, but here's, here's, here's the thing. Uh, what, what frustrates me is that um, creationists, all they do is try to shoot holes in known science. Why don't creationists come up with, uh, for instance, which kinds were on the ark? What yeah. did they look like? And how the hell did we get millions of species from 1,400 kinds well, on one boat in 6,000 years if we don't have evolution? What's the mechanism? To be that fair, Peter... Some creationists are starting to think about that little problem. Do not have the champagne ready to pop the cork on it yet. 
Uh, I I pointed out uh, just at the beginning of the show, so you might not have caught it, but I had done an analysis. There was an actual listing of the kinds, and this is literally the first I've ever seen. It's at the Creation Art Museum, uh, Art Encounter, um, where there's an actual listing of 1,470 kinds uh, that were aboard the Ark. And thankfully, they listed off which ones were extinct and how many were clean and unclean and all that, so you could figure out how many animals in that were involved. So I did a spreadsheet. They I have a list have now? Names. Huh? Yeah. What? They have a list now? Oh, yeah, yeah. I discovered it quite by accident. Oddly enough, it's not put up at their website. So you can't get the list. You can see a picture of the list, but not the list. Yeah. And so yeah. it's very blurry. I, I, I tried blowing it up as much as I could, and I can't read the actual listings of the animals, but I could see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and multiple. And so I, I put in just placeholders. But anyway, can, I, can I now you, know that according to can the... You, uh, 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 hmm? can, can you link to that? in? in oh, the oh just go here? to the Ark Encounter, the Ark Encounter website. Uh, and there's uh, in the one of the little subsections there. There's a picture of the deck plan of the ark, uh, the ark thing. It's only four decks. That surprised me that there weren't that many uh, decks on it. And then uh, another picture of the the ark uh, kinds aboard it. And so you can see there's a synapsid kind and and flightless birds and uh, unclean mammals and blah blah blah. Uh, and so, uh, but you but it's not clear enough, unfortunately, to be able to read the details. So I asked anybody who has access to this to get a, a, a high resolution picture so we can see the details. It's revealing that they've not put this up as a list on their website. Why not? Because then we could see what names are on it. But anyway, I did a generic <laughs> thing uh, to just total up how many were extinct and yeah. so forth and so on. You ask why not and you don't laugh while you're asking. I know, I know, <laughs> it is, it's a rib tickler. We know exactly why they don't put it up. But anyway, the, of the 1,470 kinds they claim were aboard the Ark, 54% of them are extinct by their list. So as a, as a preserver of, of life, it was really bad <laughs> because it, this, everything dropped dead. Strangely enough, animals that supposedly lived a long time ago seem remarkably prone to post-flood extinction. And, and apparently they, they're driving on, see, the other aspect of it was to try to figure out where they were getting their numbers from. So in the amphibian case, it was clear they got it from this Marcus Ross paper that the uh, the number of kinds that he lists is the same number that I came up with off of their chart. And so it's basically at the family level. Yeah. In other cases, uh -huh. they're drawing off presumably Leitner's analysis of birds because they've got like 179 uh, kinds there. And I think that was the number that she came up with. So some of these are, are, uh, um, are pretty obvious, but if so, the, each one of them has buried problems because the bird things have all of the finches as one single kind, which means all of the evolutionary evidence of the origins of Darwin's finches are all correct. They are functionally accepting it, just like they were accepting the horse sequence. Uh, and uh, But I'd like to see the details. I'd like to see how many dinosaurs they put on the ark. Uh, did they, if there are only 20, then that means they're probably going by families. Well, I would have, I would have, I would have a couple of questions to to Ken Ham when it when it comes to the Ark. I mean, um, God uh, seems to be seems to be omniscient. So why would he put dinosaurs on the Ark and have them go extinct immediately after the flood? Uh, because God was responsible for the animals. Oh, that oh, to, oh! To the you, ark. you should you should follow the apologetics here. Because there's a bunch of little grass who insist dinosaurs took a long time to go extinct. And so there were Chinese fighting uh, uh, stegosaurs, and there were Cambodians painting pictures of stegosaurs, well, and there were yeah. pictures according of to, Romans to, uh, uh, capturing synapsids. Yeah. Uh, and so you've got all of these weird little they're groups they're on there where, they, where they're basic, basically swallowing all of the cryptozoology lore, uh, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, well, yeah, I was going to say... It, to me, that's to me that's not a surprise because um, uh, Tim Chafee uh, did a did a tour with a couple of atheists where he he was the the tour guide, and um, uh, one of the one of the the people on that tour was David Smalley from uh, um, oh no I forgot the radio program. Yeah. Well, never mind. Uh, he, he he's a he's a he has a very very famous uh, radio program. If any of the listeners can maybe help me out in the chat and and remind me, 
uh, dogma debate. That's it. So, and Tim Chafee uh, uh, revealed that the technology on the Ark was 14th century. So, and and that was uh, uh, they did that because they did otherwise they wouldn't have had the technology needed to sustain life on the Ark. So, if if you're going to get that dishonest. I'm I, I'm not sure where you're going to go with with any statements that people like that make because oh uh, Crocker Squirrel's I, got a question for me uh, weren't stegos more or less restricted in North American extreme Western Europe Stegosaurus as a genera yes although Stegosaurids are in fact known in Asia as well and had spread across <coughs> in a variety of form uh, they they start out with relatively spiky rather than plates. And so the, the plated stegosaurus type is a very derived specialized form, and it's only known in North America. So none of the ones that any um, Asiatic uh, um, descendants of Noah uh, would have presumably known about uh, would have had access to that kind of stuff. And it, 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 it's, it's a, <clears throat> I was going to say, why must you bring these pesky little things called facts into this details, discussion? Yeah, details, details. Yeah. If you want to hear. Uh, anyway, the, 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 the fascination, uh, there's been an evolution of creationism over this point. That uh, the, 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 the need to find uh, living uh, uh, brachiosaurs in Africa uh, in order to buttress the Bible uh, has only developed over the course of the last 20 years or so. That, that it dawned on every, there's a whole bunch of imperatives of the flood model that, that have been like ticking time bombs over the years. And the first one was, where the hell were the dinosaurs? Uh, dinosaurs existed, therefore they had to have been on the ark, therefore what happened to them afterwards, why did they die out, etc. All of that follows logically from it. The other part has to do with the chronology aspect, that for years I... Hmm? I was going to say, Squirrels wanted to come in. You want me to send him the link? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and send him a link there. Yeah, we're, All right. we're already past, Squirrel, the, we're already past the hour, so who knows how long this will last. I don't want to go too long on it, but but I, I think it's kind of an interesting subject. The, the logical imperative of flood geology, that um, in order for the flood event to be correct, it's got to be consistent with all the data field. And what you got is the fact that Egypt doesn't seem to notice the flood. So they would be faced with an awkward problem with flood and Egypt. It's they got to move Egypt. So it, it, it dawned on me that, that nobody in the creationism movement were Egyptologists. So they literally didn't notice this problem as a problem. But eventually there's been a couple guys, I think his name is Down and there's a few others, who are the ones that the light bulb went, or the, maybe the, 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 the candle uh, went off over their head yeah. to where it dawned on them that Egypt is a contiguous culture. And yeah. in order for it to be kept as a contiguous culture, it's got to all be after the flood. They can't allow any of Egypt to predate the flood. Because if they do, you've got Egyptians writing in hieroglyphs and making pyramids and doing all this shtick. And then they're obliterated in the flood. And Noah's kids, breeding like rabbits, eventually repopulate Egypt and pick up exactly where the Egyptians left off with the same gods, the same cultural style, the same clothings, the same burial practices, yeah. the same the whole shtick. Uh-uh. That doesn't make any sense. Nope. So they've got to put and little wheels, little rollers under the entire Egyptian culture. And not merely back to the pyramid age. They've got to pull. Hello, Bailey. Introduce yourself. Hey, how you guys doing? Oh, you're 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 yeah, you're, 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 squirrel. you're, you're uh, under a complete you're a crocus squirrel. I was expecting yeah. to see a crocus squirrel. You're 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 coming in under a a false flag avatar. Yeah, huh? that's even that's even worse. I'm not signed into the right account. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Yes, you're you're labeled as Ren and yeah, and, yeah. and a charming anime style of a female face that looks like she's going to be discussing of um the the secrets of magic with yeah. a K. But, yeah. yeah, since we're talking fallacies and arguments, and they're just really bad. If you want a good one, I had uh, I, yesterday. I actually called it somewhere because uh, I had a spat with these people. Actually, a friend of mine had a spat, and I came in, and you know, I'm not known for being nice all the time, and I wasn't nice when I went into the discussion that they were in for them lying about her. 
And what happened is I ended up calling them. But before I called in, they were talking about how she was being dishonest with one of her things where she just was more or less shotgunning. Although it wasn't so much shotgunning if you watch the comments of what she was making for the time. And then they turn around and use the whole, well, you're just a bag of of protoplasm. You're evolved stardust and pond scum. And evolution is just an interpretation of the facts. Yet, my friends, the... uh, the intellectually dishonest one. <laughs> well, I mean, laugh. she believes she comes from a ribectomy, so you know uh, what? What can hell can you do? Uh, actually, she wouldn't. Have I, come I put from a, that because she's trans. But, I put yeah. a link in uh, where the uh, uh, idiot was talking about Noah's children and grandchildren and right all the world's flood myths and so forth. Um, I, I discuss an awful lot of that stuff in the Dynamania chapter uh, at uh, tip uh, www.tortugan.wordpress.com. Uh, it's about a book length thing. It goes into um, the flood geology arguments. It goes into cryptozoology. It goes into the biblical flood tales and where those came from, from the Babylonians. And and uh, so you get to find out about Shur Urpak and uh, and uh, all the other little bits and, and, and how it got transmogrified over time. And then there's some sections on Kent Hovind and uh, radiometric dating and uh, uh, the the hilarious Charlton Heston, a mysterious origins of band show. I mean, there's a lot of really tickler stuff in Dynamania. I don't, I, I you know, be, be sure if you, there's one chapter that you really want to have uh, under your belt, having read from tip, please, please that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. So, I, but yeah, I'm glad you could get a chuckle out of the whole, you know, evolution is just interpretation. Like, no, that is the facts. And yeah, I didn't get a chance to touch on that because they were wanting to write it another way. And I just was like, I'm creationism is hilarious if it weren't so not hilarious. Yeah. Methodologically and the, the credulity of it, the absurdity of it. Uh, uh, Peter was was uh, bringing up a really good point there. Oh, it uh, oh, it's uh, uh, chapter number three. Old tip number three. Yeah, I would. Uh... I would say this. Now, in the tip website, you go into the upper tabs, and there will be old tip, and it'll be chapter three down in there. It's a PDF, and it's about 300 pages long. You'll probably have to download the references, too. Uh, that's a separate file. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was originally intended as an old book book. Uh, so it has footnotes and all that kind of stuff, which is not the way I construct the data field now. But I did an awful lot of fun on that stuff because it was uh, laying out um, – the, the basic problems with flood geology, their mythologies, and how they're they're deck stacking their argument and all the rest. And yeah. um, uh, I want, it, there's stuff on Richard Milton, and there's an awful lot of material in there. And I, I'm very proud of the chapter because even though it's been written about, yikes, almost 15 years ago now, uh, it's still, still pretty up to date. And there would be new information to add to it to upgrade it but the basic points that i'm making are still valid now so i'm i'm quite pleased on that one and it's there's a lot of fun in there oh gosh i mean it, there, there's no place like young earth creationism for people to just shoot their gonads off yeah. there, there's no there's no counterpart of that in the kind of straight-laced intelligent design <laughs> way you've got people in the young earth creationism movement that are just gobsmackingly hilariously stupid and yeah. and can't hold in is it oh, it's it's i would i mean I've, I've said this before i mean it's it's hard to parody young earth creationism because yeah. they do a good job themselves like, no you see cap you're not being quite strong enough here they do an astounding job parodying okay. themselves true, true. Like, you like, can't you can't the, satirize that yeah, it, like, it doesn't work. The, the person who I called in, and I didn't have a chance to bring this up. They're actually supposed to be going on my channel. I was supposed to go on theirs type thing. I've had them on before, and we've had our issues, but we're trying to work it out again. I don't, I don't know why I'm trying here, but um, but I was, I was supposed to have them on, and I plan on grilling them on my channel for the fact of their idiot. Because one of the things that one of them said was that K State out here in Kansas is a state-funded indoctrination center. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. That's, that's that's from their point of view, all normal education is an yeah. indoctrination system because and, it says things they don't want to be true. Yeah, and and they, uh, and like I said, they, they were complaining about my friend basically asking them questions, trying to type fast. She's not a fast typer. Um, I'm slow, and she's probably slower than me. Um Ooh. And with that, 
so she was trying to keep up with them. So she wasn't shotgunning it more or less. She, they were saying something. She was trying to respond to it quickly before they moved on to another point. And they were calling that dishonest. But then again, they straw man with you're just bags of protoplasm. You're just evolved pond scum. Evolution is an interpretation of the facts. Um, you know, I, I love when they tell me I don't know the Bible or what it means, and it's I'm, I sit there and laugh because I'm like, no, I I have friends who are theists who will come to me for help on Bible verses if they get into it with atheists because they know I know what I'm saying, and it's just oh, and, it's so. And laughable. everybody has access to the thing. I've got on my smartphone um, Bible Gateway which is yeah. a, a religious apologetic site, but it's it's a text search. You can look up scripture. You can look up yeah. alternate versions of scripture I, for translations. It's a handy little tool to oh, use yeah. because that way you don't it. have to depend on on people to go flailing around on stuff. You can say, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> it's like when they try to say the Bible uh, 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 bans slavery. No, it doesn't. No, it, doesn't. No, no, not it does not. You see, the, it, what's even more fun is you have some versions of the Bible that are <clears throat> that are translated thought by thought and it and they're supposed to be accurate for, for, between various thoughts and they're going no that's not the way you do that but then i don't i have yet to see an original version of any of this mess yeah so we can't even verify that the word for word translations are in fact word for word. Yeah, some There's some things go back farther than others. They've got earlier versions of some of these things, and the Bible scholars thrash over them. But I I can bypass all of that. I will say, okay, we will take the text, and you can do whatever version you like. It doesn't matter. It's not yeah. going to help your case any. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whatever version you like, you can look at its internal structure there. So my you can start, uh, and I did this when I was in Sunday school. Uh, I noticed that Kings and Chronicles are all covering a lot of the same incidents. Uh -huh. And you yeah. can start looking through the little footnotes at the bottom. Oh, see First Kings, blah, blah, blah. And you find out that the two versions aren't accurate. They're different from one another. And so you can start spotting the first little tr tr uh, the trickle of internal contradictions. Uh, yeah, uh, that you find it's, out all, all the things. Um, and and uh, it, it, anybody can do that. It, it, so. My and one of the things my friend called him out on that they did not like very much because I guess they didn't think that she would know this. Um, although I know she knows it because I taught it to her, taught her this actual – this particular argument. They brought up the Ten Commandments, and she flat out asked, which one? Which the real yeah, one? The Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah, there's the official sort of, and then there's the other one that's farther down uh, yeah, that actually sure. lists off the Exodus commandments. That's not the, 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 the block of wood that you or the stone that you put up in the the uh, thing to the, the covenant. Yeah, and the, the only time the and so it all depends on which versions you have, yeah. and, 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 and within the own text. Plus, um, some of the commandments in there are pretty dumb. Yeah. And the only time it's mentioned as the Ten Commandments is in Exodus 34. She pointed that out to him. They're like, no, it's Exodus 20. They started in Exodus 18. I'm like, then you're saying that they start further back, which they don't. They, as far as I know, they start in 20. Um, I think 18 is where he starts to go up to the mountain, but he doesn't start getting commands till there. And the list goes mm -hmm. on through, I think, 25. Might be 26. Another fun one to do. So, it's so Again, many. Uh, Map of time is really critical. I've always thought historically on everything. Yeah. My music collection behind me is filed in the birth years of the composers, not <laughs> alphabetically or stylistically. So therefore, you've got your Bach and your Scarlatti and uh, uh, Vivaldi and all as a cluster because they're all born in 1685. Uh, and so uh, to my mind, that gives me a different set of continuity. So on the Exodus, you can start off with a good methods question and ask them when they think the Exodus took place. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or and watch I have, the first I, have, I have I have a I I have what I have a a really fun little argument that they like or that they don't like. They just like yeah. this one intensely. Violations of physics. Oh yeah. Violations of known physics, especially the one about Joshua and the Amalekites. I think I've mentioned this one a few times yeah. on movie night. It's yeah. it's terrible. Oh yeah, you could disrupt you could disrupt our galaxy with the amount of energy that would be expended to do any of those things. Oh yeah, the the uh yeah, and anybody on the face of the earth would either be goop if they were on the basically the night side of the earth at that time, or because the hard force, they didn't know or they would have been for thrown them, into space. For them, the sun is just a big light bulb up in the sky. Well, it and it's easy matter. for God to stop it. 
Squirrel, uh, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, but the force exerted that would that you would be flying off the Earth at for the stoppage would be enough not only to clear escape velocity of the Earth, but isn't there? Wouldn't you actually be going? Well, no, you're, you're, at the equator, you're moving stopped. at about 900 miles an hour. Uh, up at my latitude, it's significantly less. But nevertheless, if the okay. Earth were instantaneously stopped, however, let me play devil's advocate here. That that the if you're thinking biblically, God can simply transcend or or cancel the laws of inertia. So theoretically, he can stop the Earth like a like a, a special effect and compensate for all of the things by magical fiat. So I mean, to be fair, if you can cause universes to happen by by miracle, if you can be resurrected and simultaneously three persons but one and all of that, um, of all comp compensating for inertia like the Enterprise when it accelerates in normal light speed uh, is just a trivial little detail if you're thinking biblically. So I, I don't make a big deal out of that argument. Uh, uh, William Jennings and, Bryan made a big deal out of it uh, at the Scopes trial, but I don't because you know they can always just say miracle. Yeah, yeah. and, and then have, miracle is a, is an argument that I don't. Yeah. Miracle is an argument that I can put down in fairly short order. Mm, yeah. I, I, I bypassed around it because the, the the problems I like pointing up are independent of that. Uh, well, the fact that the Bible uh, dating dating the Exodus is yeah. Go ahead and finish your question there, Cap. Um, well, yeah. well, I was just going to uh, – oh, you had somebody else had a question, Cap? Oh, you I, I was going to ask a squirrel question and, and for everyone else. But correct me if I'm wrong, but if they speed C up to what it needs to be for light to instantaneously hit us, you know, to make their six-day creation count accurate, wouldn't that um, – basically, wouldn't that basically – with the speed that it would be going and how fast it would have had to expand or get here, wouldn't that have more or less basically made the universe implode in on itself with the way uh, the physics work? No, what we on would that? wind up what we would wind up with is, is an almost instantaneous big rip. Uh, actually, what would really happen is that light would just kind of go away. Okay. Uh, we'd kind of go away at first, and then there would be, and then we would have major problems okay. because all of the little atoms, and, uh, all of the little molecules and atoms and shit would just go and be gone. Yeah, you got yeah. a basic yeah. problem: e equal mc square. The c being the speed of light. Alter the speed of light; it alters the m part, and it alters the, the energy balance in the universe automatically. And and so it's no coincidence that. Although there are a bunch of ad hoc explanations that creationists offer to compensate for things, basically the modern ones acknowledge that all of the galaxies are where we think they are, but they're not old. They just appear to be old, or there's been an old that occurred really fast because of some tweak that they have to make. And they'll make a tweak. This is true of Baumgartner and various others that played around with all this stuff over the years. Oh, and the and then. And, and yeah, and and so they'll they'll tweak one variable to solve the problem, but it produces another problem. So then they eventually reach a stage where it's a mess. So they now have to come up with another ad hoc yeah, explanation. It's, so it's like the the same thing with the with the beast of the apocalypse of the month club. It's the let's try to figure out why Andromeda is two million light years away club. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to realize that. If you cut, the, if you if you increase the speed of light, the amount of mass must therefore decrease, which results in a, which results in an in, an overall increase in energy available, and yeah. that res, that would and presuming for three seconds that anything survived, uh, nobody would be able to see anything very quickly. Let us let us yeah. just say that it has yet to be the case that young Earth creationists have worked out a plausible and self-consistent cosmology based upon varying the speed of light. Well, there's then there's the other side. If you if you remove if you increase the speed of light and leave the, the amount of mass in question the same, <coughs> the amount of energy goes up by even more, and things go really haywire. Yeah, we would. Yeah, we this would was the same it. problem. Uh, we, look how flood geology has evolved over time. Uh, oh, yeah. The flood geology of the 1960s had basically the continental distribution we're familiar with, and the mountain ranges we're familiar with. 
And then gradually it was pointed out there ain't enough water to cover all of that. And Mount Ararat's not the tallest mountain, so there's a problem. And yep. why is why are they landing on Mount Ararat? So pretty soon they start flattening mountain ranges and rearranging continents and then deciding to adopt Pangaea or maybe Rodinia. And then they and and uh, oh uh, oh oh yeah, wise has these massive uh, uh, monumental super islands of floating vegetation mats with the whole populations and ecosystems wandering around and then slamming into places. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's misplaced concreteness on a colossal scale. I mean, it would make a, 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 a yeah, hilarious movie. The oh, whole yeah, it's, Himalayas go away. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, there's so many issues that arise with any of the arguments. And one of the ones I love to look at and, it's the whole, you know, well, the earth was relatively level, you know, there wasn't really many mountains in the, before the flood. So well, why was there a Mount Ararat? At yeah, all? And that raises that question of how do you know what Mount Ararat is? And, and as I point out in, in uh, Dynamadia, Mount Ararat is a relatively recent player on the apologetic scene. That, that began to be associated with the, uh, the Noah story only in the 1200s. Uh, that originally the, the phrase was the mountains of Ararat, which is a particular region in in, uh, in Turkey. It's not where Mount Ararat is. Agridabi, uh, or whatever the name of it is, uh, is not actually in that spot. And so it only got associated much later on uh, uh, to the bits. And so it, it's, it, it has all of the earmarks of an accreting folktale uh, that is just inconsistent, in, in addition, independent of all of the physics and the science part of it. But the things I like to point out um, on the Bible problems, like the contradictions between Chronicles and Kings or the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew and Luke, train wreck, is permanent. It doesn't go away based on flood geology. It, it's it's just as much of a problem for intelligent designers as it is for young earth creationists. It's, it's a terrible problem because it doesn't involve radiometric dating. It doesn't involve, it involves internal contradictions in the text. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, and it's there's another one. Uh, I don't remember where it is, but one in the New Testament, one account okay, in the New Testament has a guy dying ten years later than or ten years earlier than the other one. So he was literally alive and fighting a battle ten years after his death. Yeah. Oh, and there was that king where there's a typographical error, and it says that the guy became king when he was 14 years old, and the other one says when he was four or something like that. It, it, you know, there are the ones that are that are a clearly reasonable typographical errors, but the question is, you have to wonder why there are any at all. But yeah. the Matthew Luke train wreck is really significant. Is that this the, involves messianic credentials? This involves the whole Bethlehem birth story. This involves the yeah. de descendant from King David. These are essential parts of dogma. Yeah. And the fact that the one and only sources, Matthew and Luke, that go into this are completely at odds with each other on every yeah. single point is a serious yeah. problem. Yeah. And it's hilarious to see them and how they tap dance around it. I went so into it fun. in the the because the, the Bible tells me yeah. so chapter. Another one. That, Another that, argument yeah. I've I've used uh quite a bit before too is um because you can't argue this the uh census of Corinthius and sorry if I screwed up the name Corinthius and King Corinthus yeah and King Herod I mean even being as generous as possible using the new modern calendar that we use not their older one but the one we use which puts them at one CE Again, that, that's being the most generous as King Herod says, that one CE. So so the, Herod wanted the order of the dead baby right the day day of his death. We'll, we'll even grant you that. I'm being as generous as possible. <clears throat> but the census doesn't happen until 6 CE. You got a five-year gap there. So Jesus yeah. was born in 1 CE and then again in and 6. Why, and, why, and then why move your population to central areas when you could just send one guy – out to all of the uh, out to all of these places. Never mind that Nazareth wasn't actually settled until seventy CE. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. That well, that's remember another... the reason why Bethlehem is there at all. Uh, Bethlehem, in, in order to be the Messiah, the Messiah had to be born of King David's lineage by direct descent, and he had to be born in Bethlehem, which is David's city. And that's why those are in the two versions. But the problem is they don't match. Uh, nope. That you've got like, this all. completely different accounting at all, literally. The genealogies don't match. Uh, Matthew and Luke have completely different sons of David and all that. And, and the headstands the conservatives go through on this to where with a perfectly straight face, 
conservatives rewrite the New Testament and put in Mary's name in Luke's genealogy. Well, yeah. who the Why hell gave they... them permission to do that? <laughs> uh, I can't imagine why they why why they would do such a silly thing. Yeah, really. Yeah, except they have to save the data, and then of course, uh, uh, Herod. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's to be fair. I think if anybody kind of got the chronology right, it was probably Luke. Um, that there was in fact a Quirinius who was governor of Syria. There was a census of Israel when it was annexed at a time when he was governor of Syria. Uh, there, it all makes sense. And therefore, Jesus was born around 6 AD. Whoops. And so yeah. we got a little bit of a problem there. But uh, uh, Matthew's story is almost certainly entirely made up. And well, everything Usher, about it doesn't well, here's get corroborated. Thing, Bishop Usher say that, uh, that, that, our, that our little buddy Jesus was born in 4 BC? Uh, oh well, yeah. that was because of that was because of the Herod, Herod issue. You yeah. have to remember that at the time, the new astronomy was working out eclipses, and by the 17th century, they had discovered that the eclipse, the lunar eclipse that that was occurring at the time that Herod died, uh, uh, was apparently 4 BC. And because yeah. the argument was that the creation of the world was 4,000 years before the birth of Christ, because Christ could have only been born in 4 BC, that puts the creation of the world back to 4,004. So that's where the four came in. It was because of the new cutting edge science and scholarship yeah. of 1700. Yeah. yeah. And then another one I love to point out is that there has to be at least three different Jesuses in the New Testament at minimum. Because there's three different last words attributed to Jesus. Now, I'm not much on uh, human biology, but I don't think you can go, Father, forgive them for what they do, for they don't know what they do. You die. Oh, wait. No, no you come back to life again. Oh, uh, you know, it is finished. Die. Oh, come back to life again. Well, but then you do, you do what Jesus Christ Superstar did. You put all versions in. Yeah. So you have him saying in one order, then another one, then another one, in the same way that Christmas, the Christmas pageants routinely merge Matthew and Luke. So you yeah. end up with all of that taking place as one contiguous narrative when they are two separate narratives that are mutually contradictory. And if you're willing to do that, then, boy, there's no stopping it. it, it well, we've gone way past, oh, we've yeah. gone way past oh, the evolution oh. hour here, and we're... We're far removed from Homo erectus, so yeah. I'm going to uh, 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 pull the show up in here uh, and, and conclude the show. We'll have to have further discussions on these subjects matter at all. Yeah. I'm still pointing out anybody who wants to arrange me to debate anybody or lecture, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly open to it. Hey, buy me a, a plane ticket and bring me down and, and lecture your whatever group uh, that you'd like to have. I'd be perfectly yeah. happy to do that. But anyway, thanks for everybody coming in there. Uh, Jackson had to skedaddle and Peter is popping in and out like, like nobody's business and Crocus Squirrel finally looked like a Crocus Squirrel as it yeah. should be. But anyway, thank you, gang. And and next week uh, we'll be continuing the exciting world of dismantling uh, uh, Rupi and, uh, and Sanford. Uh, au revoir. Au revoir. Aloha.